This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Hey, aloha, and welcome to Stan Energy Man. I'm Stan Osterman, your guest host of Stan Energy Man, every Friday here at 12 o'clock on Think Tech Hawaii, where community matters. It's been a heck of a year. I mean, how can it already be Thanksgiving? And today's Black Friday, which means all the businesses finally go in the black after staying in the red all year long. They finally get to sell Christmas stuff starting today. But I'm willing to bet that Cyber Monday is going to take over Black Friday any time now because they're already encroaching. I see it happening on my computer every time I turn it on. Anyway, today's show is a solo show, but I, wanted, I promised everyone we'd catch up on some of the things that I, I experienced uh, two weeks ago in California at the Fuel Cell Seminar and Energy Exposition. And um, it was a great event. We got to do a lot of great things. But I'd like to start off with uh, the first day at the Fuel Cell and, and Energy Expo was actually run by the Department of Energy for an effort they call H2 at scale. And I'm also going to talk a little bit about the Hydrogen Council because um, they were an integral, I think they're an integral part of what the Department of Energy is trying to do. So the U.S. Department of Energy has embarked on a push to get hydrogen up to scale to compete with fossil fuels in all sectors. And this, the entire afternoon of the first day was dedicated to presentations and discussions uh, hosted by the Department of Energy. The focal presentation was given by Mr. Brian Pivovar, or Pivovar, from the National Renewable Energy Lab, also known as NREL. He talked about the work being done by all of the national labs that make up the steering committee and seven subcommittees, almost 100 people, focused on moving hydrogen from the, fu future, the fuel of the future to the energy storage that is fully ready for prime time now. These folks are looking at hydrogen from every perspective, and from the biggest part, uh, the biggest part of the puzzle is actually focusing on what it costs to make clean hydrogen, which has always been the it doesn't pencil out story that I kept hearing over and over again. These folks have finally gotten to the point where they're saying it's gonna pencil out, it's already started. So H2 at scale, is a congressionally funded effort that started in 2016 as part of the Department of Energy's Big Idea Summit in April of 2016. And I'm proud to say that Hawaii and HCAT in particular had input into this foundational effort. So one of the illustrations that Mr. Pivovar starts with um, is a side-by-side -side comparison of two photos of downtown Denver. On the left is a beautiful December day, and on the right is a smog bank shot of the exact same city the very next day. And the reason this caught my attention is that we in Hawaii often fail to see the pollution we generate because we have trade winds that sweep our skies clear most of the time. And when we do have fog, we blame it on the volcano. But if you do a dawn patrol surfing thing like I try and do in the summertime, you can often see Hawaiian smog hanging to the south over the horizon on any early summer morning. We're not as clean as we think we are, and it's time to take responsibility and clean up our act. And that picture of Denver really brought that home. It's, it's like that in every city. Sometimes the weather cooperates, sometimes it lets you see what you're really doing. And in Hawaii, we're often fooled to thinking that we have really clean air, and we don't. We have air that's polluted and pushed out to sea, and that's not right. The first graph on this slide deck um, shows a comparison between nuclear coal, natural gas, wind, and solar. And it shows that the cost of the power for each of those technologies currently, based on the fully burdened and unsubsidized cost, and it shows clearly that nuclear and coal are hovering around between a nine, 9 and 10 kilowatt hours per dollar. Natural gas is next up at around 15 kilowatt hours per dollar, and solar is clocking in at 18 kilowatt hours per, do per dollar. Wind is coming in at the top, the best value, at about 22 kilowatt hours per dollar. And that puts wind at about four to four and a half cents per kilowatt hour. As a rule of thumb, we, see that seven cents, we say that seven cents a kilowatt hour is a break-even point for electrolysis to compete with gasoline and diesel. So if you use those numbers I just quoted, you, you, you can see that both solar and wind are already beating that seven cents a kilowatt hour production cost. And if you can factor in some other things like transportation costs, compression costs, and things like that, and you can get those costs down, we're going to not only already be a good competition with, with gasoline and other fossil fuels, we could start beating it. 
The next major point of his study is that the, the grid, as the grid adopts more and more intermittent renewable, the power uh, that's needed to store it gets to be above 25%. That storage challenge is usually looked at as traditional battery storage, and it becomes much harder. And above 54% intermittent renewables, the challenge of storing energy becomes extremely difficult. Here in Hawaii, we're at about 18 to 20% storage of intermittent renewables. And you can tell that Hawaiian Electric is already struggling by the, how many uh, interconnect agreements they si they'll sign off on and how many of our solar companies are struggling right now. So these folks on, these, on this committee looked at, at uh, all the advantage of manufacturing, storing hydrogen as a multifaceted solution to several energy challenges, including using natural gas, uh, using the natural gas grid to move hydrogen for, for energy. It also stores hydrogen for energy and using electrolyzers as a load to help stabilize and, and balance the grid is also another technique that they looked at as being really a pivotal role for hydrogen as we start to absorb more and more renewable energies. Not only uh, is the hydrogen important for that, but using hydrogen to advance electric vehicles and making synthetic fuels, up upgrading oil and biomass energy density. Um, a lot of the biomass and, and um, bi biodiesels and things that we use just don't carry quite the energy density or the amount of energy they need, but you can actually boost their energy carrying capacity by injecting hydrogen. Manufacturers of fertilizer is another area where hydrogen could, uh, could help lower carbon emissions in the manufacture of hydrogen, of fertilizers. Uh, metals refining like steel and uh, glass and other ceramic industries use hydrogen. And there's a wide range of um, industrial processes that are filled by hydrogen currently at smaller scales, but when you put them all together, it's quite a huge market. In addition, hydrogen can be used to modify grids that utilize distributed generation to produce power at the point of demand and eliminating the long haul grid lines that stretch between um, cities and some of the urban or suburban and rural areas that they service. In summary, the U.S. Department of Energy sees hydrogen as an economically viable way to help a variety of sectors as we focus on cleaner power generation. Considering the fact that hydrogen is so plentiful and that the technology is so well understood, it's only a matter of time before hydrogen takes over as the dominant energy storage technology bringing stable prices and overall lower prices to our society and actually around the world. The fuel cell seminar and energy exhibition that, that I went to on day two, so that, that what I just talked about was what the Department of Energy ran on the first day, the first afternoon, morning was registration, afternoon was the H2 at scale run by the Department of Energy. The rest of the, the next two days were run by the, um, the folks running the fuel cell seminar and energy uh, exposition. And what I'm gonna do is just run through some photos and talk about what we, we looked at there. The first one is a really poor shot of Queen Mary, but I wanted to throw it in there because uh, we kind of forget that uh, not only is Long Beach a great place to uh, visit as a vacation thing and has some great sites like and places to tour like the Queen Mary, but for those of you from Hawaii, as you walk along that waterfront there, there's a historical um, montage of all of the, the um, uh, what they call the, the uh, Transpac um, races, the sailboat races that occur between the mainland and Hawaii and have been going on since the uh, early 1900s, if not earlier. Um, the, the, the names and faces that you see on those, uh, those photos uh, along that boardwalk are just amazing. And to think how many years Hawaii's had a connection right there to Long Beach, it's, it's pretty cool. Um, we held our event at the convention center there and it's uh, just like our convention center is a pretty impressive new structure. Um, it, can, it can host quite a, a number of people, um, but it was a great place to meet and good, good places to have breakouts. The next shot is uh, the audiences at the plenary session, um, and this will give you an idea of how many folks showed up. Now, that, the conference this year had between seven and 800 attendees, and this picture here is typical of not only the, the plenary session and the session that uh, the DOE ran with the hydrogen at scale, um, but this was a well-attended event. Uh, the the uh, sponsors and the, um, the event um, organizers were really happy with the turnout. And I can tell you that uh, usually by day two, people start tapering off and the room gets empty. This room was full every single day. 
And this was uh, one of the plenary sessions, the first one. In fact, I think the speaker up there um, looks like he's one of, from, from one of the panels. Um, next, we can look at the next photo. Um, the panels that, that happened were, uh, were concise. They had great industry and government folks showing up as well as some investors that talked about um, the different aspects of um, hydrogen and what the role it's gonna play in the future. And next shot is uh, one of my favorite presenters. Uh, he's a guy from California, his name is Tyson Erkley. He's been a, a guest on my show uh, once or twice. And he is actually uh, directly under Governor Brown in California as um, doing the coordination for hydrogen infrastructure and particularly hydrogen stations. So I almost see him as uh, my big brother, although he's a lot younger than me, uh, over in California doing hydrogen infrastructure like I'm, I'm trying to get done in Hawaii here. Uh, the next shot we have is some of the vendor displays. Um, there weren't a ton of, of vendors down there that I'm used to. Usually I'm, I'm used to seeing hundreds of vendors. There were probably about 50 or so vendors downstairs, but as you can see, Honda was there, Toyota was there. Um, there were a lot of um, vendors other than just hydrogen vendors. There were um, folks that do compression, folks that make uh, the components for the hydrogen, uh, um, electrolyzers and dispensers and things like that. Um, there was a, a good turnout and, and I was really happy. I got to talk to some folks and learn quite a bit talking to some of these vendors. The next shot shows uh, from another perspective. You can see that it wasn't cram packed over there, but uh, this is not during a real busy time. During uh, the receptions and stuff, this place was, was actually packed with people. But Toyota, you can see the sign off there to the right. They had a Mirai there. Honda had a Clarity, their brand new uh, Clarity. And uh, you got to take a good look up close to those. And I have a picture of uh, at least the Toyota coming up. Um, next, we had some uh, folks. These are, these are some of my favorite folks because the gentleman in the center there, Abbas Ghadarzi, is uh, one of the contractors that we actually use a lot out here with the Air Force to do our vehicle conversions and run our hydrogen station. And to his right is, I want to say Mike. Uh, I don't remember his name right off the top of my head, but he's the head engineer at the fuel cell division of US Hybrid over in Connecticut. And what you see in the front left there is an 80 kilowatt fuel cell that's designed to go into buses and trains and, and big vehicles. Now, when I talk about fuel cells, you know, with people that come into our shop, I, I try and get them to focus on the scale. 80 kilowatts is 80,000 watts of power. It's just shy of, you know, 100 kilowatts. Is, that's a lot of power. The average house only needs like two kilowatts of power, between two and three kilowatts of power, maybe four if you have a really big house to run on. That one box right there gives you 80 kilowatts of power, and they can pack that all into a bus, and it gives you an idea of why fuel cells are so advantageous in the transportation sector, because that's the, the weight and the size of equipment makes a huge difference in transportation, and that 80 kilowatt fuel cell is big enough to run a good sized truck. I think right now they're putting two of them in big city buses and, and on some smaller trains to run the trains. So. That just gives you an idea of, of the technology that was on display. In the back um, is, is some of the other control equipment uh, that, that Abbas pr actually produces in California. He has um, production in California. He has a, a, an office here in Hawaii and has uh, five employees here in Hawaii, which is nice for our state. And uh, he just bought out a fuel cell production company um, over in Connecticut. And they're starting to crank out these fuel cells, including a 150 kilowatt fuel cell. So we're going to take a quick break now and go to talk a little bit about some of the other shows here on ThinkTech and maybe even hopefully talk about raising some funds for ThinkTech Hawaii. We'll be back in 60 seconds. This is ThinkTech Hawaii, raising public awareness. Aloha, I'm Kaylee Akina, and I volunteer at Think Tech Hawaii as a host of the program Hawaii Together. Why? Because Think Tech Hawaii is doing a very important job in making sure that there is a conversation ongoing between people of all backgrounds and all views. That's what civil discourse is all about, and Think Tech is an important part of finding solutions for a better Hawaii. For the first time, Think Tech Hawaii is participating in an online web based fundraising campaign to raise $40,000. It's called Give Thanks to ThinkTech, and it will run only during the month of November, and you can help. 
please donate what you can so that Think Tech Hawaii can continue to raise public awareness and promote civic engagement through free programming like mine. Please send your tax-deductible contribution by going to this website on the screen, www.thanksforthinktech.causevox.com. On behalf of the community enriched by Think Tech Hawaii's 30-plus weekly shows, thank you. Mahalo for your generosity. Hey, welcome back to Stan the Energy Man on Black Friday. I've got a colorful background, so it doesn't feel really black here in Hawaii. In fact, it's really mellow. Every place is, all the small stores are shut down, and all the big stores are going crazy. So it's actually really mellow in Honolulu today and beautiful weather. So come on by. A little windy, but who cares? Anyway, back to Long Beach. Uh, one of the other things that was great to see was um, some of the other vendors that were there. The one that I, I really spent a lot of time at was the fuel cell store. It's a great... Great place, and uh, we've actually done business with them. We bought one of those little kits that you see in the front, standing up on the table. We, it's a, actually a, a school um, demonstration kit that they sell, excuse me, that they sell to teachers, and it's a great, great kit for uh, demonstrating to, to young folks and people who don't understand the technology of how a fuel cell works. It's great because it gives you a, a way to actually physically demonstrate it. All the components are all um, clear plastic, so you can see the bubbles going, the hydrogen going one place, the oxygen going another place, and um, it's a great place to buy teaching aids. So um, they had a great display there, and I found out that they also make some of the components. They sell a lot of a kit. Those kits aren't made by them, uh, but they sell them, and some of the things that they make go into other components and kits and things that, that people make and sell uh, on the market and for industry in hydrogen. The whole thing, the whole show wasn't just about hydrogen, though. For those, those of you don't, that don't know, solid oxide fuel cells are um, also a big part of energy production and such. They work at a higher temperature, and they generally use um, natural gas or methane or sometimes um, gases off of uh, wastewater treatment plants and things. So they're not always talked about as much as hydrogen fuel cells, especially in my circles. But they are another component that, um, that, that is part of this fuel cell conference. And uh, some of the folks that do the, the high, uh, solid oxide fuel cells have their stuff there. Um, one of my favorites is the next one coming up. It's a electrochemical H2 compressor. This thing was really, really got my attention. In fact, the technology is not too cosmic, but it took, it took them probably a total of 20 to 30 minutes to, con to convince me how the technology worked. And it's really, really, well, the most impressive thing for me was when you, when you deal with um, clean electrolysis and making hydrogen using electricity, um, the one thing that creeps into your production cost that is really hard to control is compression. And uh, that's one of the things that kind of always pushed the transportation, clean transportation hydrogen over the top and competing with gasoline was having to compress to 10,000 PSI. Well, this equipment, it works very much on the same principles as uh, an electrolyzer or a uh, PEM uh, fuel cell does in terms of using a, a PEM membrane to separate the uh, hydrogen atoms after you uh, disassociate um, the oxygen from water. And so the, the bottom line is that this technology is about 30% cheaper um, than mechanical compression. And 30% when you start to scale up to a large production, that's quite a bit of savings. So I'm, I was excited to learn about this technology and to get to see how it works. And um, an additional, uh, additionally, it's quiet and uh, it uh, takes up very little space and it's, it's pretty cost effective. So I was happy to see this. The next couple shots were some equipment that they had out there that, that I really liked. Um, first, we have the Toyota Mirai. Um, I didn't take a picture of the Honda Clarity. It's a beautiful car, but what I thought really was intriguing was how the Toyota folks put uh, literally a, the, the visible uh, system right on top of the car so you can see where all the components are. So actually, if you look at the bottom of the driver's door, that's the fuel cell, 114 kilowatt fuel cell that drives this vehicle. When you look to the back, that yellow thing is one of, their, one of the hydrogen tanks, and actually near the back wheel is another hydrogen tank. And then some of the other components are, are, list, are shown there where they actually are on the car. Now what comes out of the tailpipe, of course, is basically water. So this was just kind of like a Toyota Mirai Illustrated. 
and uh, I thought it was really neat. So the next, next shot, though, was another one that really uh, gets a lot of attention, and that's, um, this is a big 18-wheeler. It's kind of hard, and probably on your screen to see it, but it's um, the big white components are the hydrogen storage and the, uh, elect the um, fuel cell that drives the uh, electric motor on this vehicle. And the front is the cab and the hood's open, so the hood kind of doesn't make it look like a truck uh, when it's open, but uh, you can actually see the fuel cell in there. And the uh, next shot, next couple shots are all just different ones. So that's from the back, looking at the, the fuel cell and uh, where the hydrogen storage is. And the next shot is um, looking uh, at the cab, so you can see the hood open there. Looks more like a truck from this perspective. Um, and then one more shot I think we have is, uh, is up close looking at the fuel cell. Now, the reason that this is kind of important in my mind is that uh, several companies now have come out with hydrogen-driven uh, trucks. But at the same time, Elon Musk, the maker of the Tesla, has also come out with a battery plug-in truck. And what I think you're going to find as these two technologies start coming out and, and actually competing, um, or, and I don't necessarily like to see batteries and hydrogen compete because I see them both as part of a solution, electric transportation solution. But when you look at uh, what's going to happen when you compete battery 18-wheelers against hydrogen 18-wheelers, I think it's going to become really, really clear that um, the 18-wheelers that run off batteries are going to be A, too expensive, um, B, not as ec ec uh, ecologically friendly as people would think they would be, um, including when you have to recharge them and you're using a lot of grid power that's, not f that's fossil fuel generated, not clean. Um, but when you go to hydrogen, you're probably going to be starting off with maybe some um, hydrogen that's produced using uh, steam methane reforming. Um, not as clean as electrolyzer, but when you get to uh, H2 at scale, like the Department of Energy is trying to do, you're going to see clean hydrogen running these long, long-range vehicles. And um, I have a story coming up later, if I have time to get to it, about uh, why that's important. So one of the other things that they have there that um, tends to get overlooked is mostly academics, called the poster session. And I have a photo of uh, what the poster session looks like. Uh, what you have here are scientific... Um, projects and demonstrations that, that a lot of the PhDs in the field have done or some companies have done, and they put it on display, and then the, the author of these, uh, these documents and, and these projects, uh, they're there for one of the evenings, and they're right by their poster and explaining how their technology works. And uh, it's a really, really good way to come up to speed on some cutting-edge technology. So that was one of the other great things about this conference. Uh, the next couple slides I got are Dave uh, Molinero, who works in my shop. That's the Honda Clarity right there, the brand new version of it. Um, Dave was, was waiting in line to try and get to drive the Honda Clarity because that was his favorite looking vehicle in the whole show. Um, he never got to drive it because we had to run off to another meeting. Uh, but he did get to drive the next one, um, the Hyundai uh, Tucson, which um, he got to zoom around the block. I, I actually drove the Tucson two years ago. And uh, it's a great little car, and Hyundai is supposed to be coming out with new technology um, that's even better than, than this one, and, and I was really happy with the Tucson. I'd say if I, if I had to rank in terms of uh, my favorite, the, Hyundai would be the first, but it's because I'm a kind of a truck person anyway, and it's an SUV. Um, but, but right there, right next to it is the, um, is the, the Mirai. I really like the Toyota. It's a, it's a really first-class ride, real quiet, a lot of power. And uh, the Honda Clarity is right there, too. Um, I've driven the Mercedes and some of the other ones, and I actually think that uh, the two Japanese-made um, cars and the Korean-made uh, Hyundai are, are really good pieces of equipment, and you're going to see them become real popular when pe once people start getting the chance to drive them. So overall, it was an information-packed week, and it was very inspirational. What I'd like to do now is uh, turn to uh, some hydrogen news that I have. I'm going to stick my glasses on so I can read this stuff. And um, there's a gentleman, I've mentioned his name before, uh, Maury Markowitz, from the Fuel Cell and Hydrogen Energy Association. And he's, uh, he's done quite a bit of, uh, of work putting together a great newsletter. And I'm just going to go through some of, the, some of the headlines in his newsletter and, and talk a little bit about them. Hydrogen Council releases a study at the United Nations Climate Conference. That Hydrogen Council is the one I mentioned at the beginning of the show where it's an international consortium that's actually pulling a lot of uh, big heavy-duty investors 
and some big um, hydrogen companies into scaling up hydrogen internationally. And they've published this, uh, this work, which is pretty comprehensive and talks about all the advantages to hydrogen. And it's out there now. So if you go to Marty's uh, webpage and look at the links, um, and his, the webpage is for the Fuel Cell Hydrogen Energy Association. Um, they have a link to their, uh, their uh, newsletter, and you can look at all these articles. Plug Power announces fuel cell deal with Norwegian, gross, uh, Norwegian grocer and Toyota subs subsidiary uh, Nell to provide renewable hydrogen for their facility. Um, so this is one of the stories that they got out there, and it's, uh, it's showing that we're really hitting the market with a lot of hydrogen, and the big names are there, Toyota, Nell, and Plug Power are three of the biggest names in hydrogen fuel cells at this point. Connecticut Town receives a Doosan fuel cell for a wastewater treatment plant. Um, some of the, some of the, the um, stationary fuel cell uh, markets are really opening up as backup power for backup, um, backup power for computer uh, storage, backup power for um, phone communications and uh, cell towers. And also um, on, in Europe, there's a, a lot of fuel, stationary fuel cell energy going into backing up um, large facilities. Another story, the California Energy Commission uh, is funding five additional stations in California. Um, now, again, announces uh, exclusive partnership with Nicola, awarded the per uh, a purchase for two demo hydrogen stations. Nicola is one of those other companies that I mentioned, um, along with Toyota, that are building, building 18-wheeler trucks um, and that are helping to show that hydrogen really is the way. And, um, I had the, the, the founder of Nicola Motors on my show a few months ago, and uh, as I recall, his truck is supposed to go 1,200 miles on 100 kilograms of hydrogen, and he's planning on building um, stations across the U.S. So think about it. This truck can go 1,200 miles, and the U.S. is about 3,000 miles across. So if he puts one station in the middle, he can, he can service the trucks going across the U.S. If he puts four or five of them scattered kind of throughout the central U.S., and you know one, or, one on each coast or two on each coast, He's pretty much got it covered for the next 10 or so years. Once that operation takes off and he goes to scale, he's gonna build 300 stations around the US. And that's gonna really, really open people's eyes on the utility of hydrogen. There's actually quite a few more studies, uh, stories here um, in, in this newsletter, and I, I really encourage you to go to the, 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 um, the site for the Fuel Cell Hydrogen Energy Association and check them out. It's a great newsletter about that Maury puts out, and I really think you'd enjoy looking at it. So, believe it or not, that gets us to the end of uh, 30 minutes of Standard Energy Man for the 24th of November, 2017, Black Friday, and uh, hope you got something out of it, and I hope to see you back here next week. Aloha.